Okay. Hi, it's JP Rainfush, and I'm here with Angela Haas. How are you doing? Hello. I'm doing well. Excellent. And we are here for another Dialogue Doctor session. Uh, and what are we looking at today? We are going to be going through a very rough scene um, that's going to be the start of a new crime fiction series that I'm hoping to launch next year. Excellent. And um, both, I mean, partially my curiosity, but I know, and our listeners, uh, what, uh, what is your writing career thus far? So I have been actually writing like space opera, humorous science fiction my whole life. And I did publish uh, Keepers of the Universe, book one, which is called First Strike, last June. And we'll be publishing Seconds to Oblivion in October, <laughs> hopefully. Excellent. And so I'm going to finish two other books in that series, but I've just wanted to switch it up a little bit and yeah. try crime fiction next. So yeah. Yeah. Excellent. 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 Do you have any um, specific questions or focus that you want to have out of this session? Like, what do you want to come out of the session with? I just want to, well, I've never written in first person. So that's like okay. the biggest issue. I've always wit written in third person limited. Mm -hmm. and so I know that's a big shift as far as um, what needs to happen there with that point of view. And um, I'm just looking for, th this is a big step for me because confidence wise, I usually never let anyone read something this rough because I'm like, I'm really a good writer. I promise is always like you are in my head, <laughs> but it, I wanted to, I wanted, I was so looking for your help on this because I know that what we talk about today is going to help me as I write the rest of the book. It's, it's concepts yeah. I can keep in mind and learn. And then I can say, Oh, JP mentioned this. I know that I need to bring this in here. So that's, that's my goal is just helping okay. me get a good start on the book on the first draft. Cool. Okay. Um, let's, I'm going to share my screen so that you can see um, the, my messy desktop. <laughs> <laughs> No judgment. And then and then actually see the document. Um, so you sent me first a plot summary. Um, and I don't know, I I don't know if you've seen this yet, my my comments or not, but we'll just kind of talk through uh some of my ideas and thoughts. I'm a person that likes to uh vomit as many ideas as I can, and maybe <laughs> you'll just grab some. <laughs> um, but that's my my approach at things. So um we'll start here because I think this gives a big bird's eye view of like characters and plot summary and then we'll drill sure. into this scene so uh for a basic plot summary uh when you sent this out to me we have you know a character who's going onto a crime scene um and they basically put someone away for a murder and it is a potential that they are innocent if there is a copycat that is currently present that is recreating those crimes. So either uh, they put away the wrong person or not. And so it's kind of like a, a really internal story here uh, with the, the fear that uh, you put the wrong person away uh, so that justice was not served. Um, so when I think of stories that revolve around like police, uh, I want to, I want to first talk about story hypothesis because that's, you know, my jam. Um, of course. <laughs> of course. Um, so, uh, yeah, when I think about like any police or detective stories that usually comes into play with fulfilling a protection need for the reader. Um, so when you're reading those sorts of things, you are reading someone who is in a state of either like they're not feeling fully protected. And um, by the end of the story, if it is one of those stories that has a um, positive ending. Uh, then they will feel this like full protection. So that that's one of the needs that I would definitely see in in these kinds of stories. Uh, and then there's the fear that your main character has with putting away the wrong person, a potential mistake in identity. So that really makes me think is another need that exists in this story about identity. Um, and so it's a kind of a question of 
uh, her own true identity. Is she a true and just person or uh, is she someone that she didn't expect herself to be? And how is she around those other people? And then definitely uh, stories that revolve around solving a case is very much around uh, the understanding need. Uh, so you're fulfilling this, this need for the reader and for your characters of um, going through a process of solving a case and understanding the truth. So ultimately, a hypothesis that I would see for this story would be protection leads to identity by means of understanding. Or in a simplified or, or happier terms, it would be, uh, we can't truly know who we are until we understand why we protect ourselves and the secrets at any cost. How does that feel for a story like this? Uh, it feels really good uh, because I'm still in sort of the outlining phases of this. So that really gives me a good direction because... I mean, I'm learning more. I'm, I've studied true crime forever. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to go into the criminal justice field because I always wanted to be an FBI profiler. So mm -hmm. I always have an interest in this stuff anyway and just study body language and all kinds of things. But it, this genre is interesting because it's like, is it about the case or is it about character or is it about both? So can you have some of those deeper meanings in these kinds yeah. of stories uh i definitely think so i think in this case <laughs> case um <laughs> i think in this case because you have a, a character who uh i mean this this really reminds me of stories like seven or mm -hmm. um any of those sort of crime solving hannibal for example or right. uh, silence of the lambs where you have this bad guy and you have this character who needs to figure out who they are in relation to both that bad character that they're uh, technically tied to in some form yes. or fashion. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's that character growth. I think when you're when you're asking, does can that exist? I think police procedural stories where you have an ongoing series with a character who doesn't change a lot. Those mm -hmm. are different than what I'm seeing here and what you've suggested as a story, because you definitely have this character who has to face this truth about, mm -hmm. did they screw up? And mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean? Are they a good cop? Are they, um, mm -hmm. you know, who are they as a person in, in relation to all that? So that really brings in that deeper true need of who are they, which is the identity aspect. So shredding everything else away i think that's your big question is like who is and her main character is a uh, detective jackie de luca who is jackie you know who is she to herself and and why has she um felt this way or or why is she exploring this path so i think that that's your that's what i'm picking up on yes. what you're laying down <laughs> yes you got <laughs> i laid that down and you got yeah. it yes absolutely yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That feels um, really good. 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 Okay. So um you gave also some character profiles with the Enneagram and Myers Briggs. And because I don't know either of them really well, I just had to make notes as to what that meant <laughs> so okay. that I could pick this all apart. Yeah, and see, and I sometimes like I don't send those things and they're like, what's their Enneagram? That so I was like, well, I'll just it helped me. It okay, helped me good. A ton. I yeah. know more about the Myers-Briggs like off the top of my head because I used to teach that for my students, but the, I'm still learning the Enneagram, but those kind of fit. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, I um the next thing we're going to talk about after we go off of this page is going to be the character voice sheet, because I think that's um going to be important for understanding Jackie before we dive into your scene. Um, okay. So, uh. All of those notes are there uh, for myself. <laughs> but then uh, at the end, you have a note here about the accused serial killer, uh, Jaron Davenport, who's also a major character. He's a narcissist with uh, histrionic personality disorder. And I made a note here, uh, ir irony of having a character with a distorted self-image or identity, uh, because I'm pointing this out as a clear indication of your true need identity. And this is a strong yeah. reflection of that. So yes. uh, this is, again, another uh, reinforcement that I think I really think your story is about identity um, and who yeah. who we are. Right. Um, I do want 
to understand this serial killer a little more um, because who who is this character? What what do you foresee Jaren as being in this story? Um, I see him as it, it's he's gonna. I'm not sure if I can articulate this, but I'm gonna do my best. I feel like he's going to be sort of like where Jackie could be if she doesn't like pay attention to what's going on around her I feel like Mm -hmm. is the negative mirror of her not really I I put the histrionic in there because I think a lot of serial killers actually do have those traits but he's kind of he's kind of someone who you know wealthy attractive I think sometimes in films serial killers are portrayed as you know not as (laughs) you know, good looking or, yeah. not, you know, kind of not as wealthy, but like he was hard to catch because people were like, he couldn't possibly be a serial yep. killer. Yep. That's kind of like, um, what was Christian Bale's role in that? You're asking the wrong person. <laughs> okay. So anyway, but <laughs> he, she was sure she was right about him and she's gonna have to go back and confront him and he almost like flirts with her and messes with her Mm -hmm. and and really knows how to push her buttons um really knows how to be a chameleon for what she what he thinks she needs in the moment to be manipulated um I've got to make it to where like he did commit a crime so he would have been in jail anyway but they they tried to tie him to these other murders and possibly maybe he didn't do it so um I don't know if that helps but it does um so what I'm thinking if if you were to go the route of like story hypothesis and have that first thing that Jackie wants to be protection um and what she truly needs is to understand herself but she is so focused on protection for this first half of the book that's where Jaren can really play mm-hmm. into uh picking at her identity because he sees the truth he knows that she he either knows that what she uh accused him of was false or knows that um whatever she accused him of has the potential of being found as being false. Uh, Mm -hmm. So like she could have used a bit of evidence that was questionable at best when uh, it was brought to light, but that was what was used to put him away. And the moment that that's discovered to be um, faulty is the moment that she kind of gets the dark night of the soul because he could get released at any time. Um, Something along those lines. So Mm -hmm. really, um, him being able at that first half of that book to pick at her whenever she has to go see him or has to go talk to him yeah. because she can't, she's so focused on being guarded that she's leaving these aspects of her identity wide open to get attacked. Um, yeah. More focused on protecting herself. Mm-hmm. Does that make and sense? He, yes, totally. And I think him being, having some sort of a, a seductive power too, because yeah. Yeah. you know he knows how to like she's more reserved and he just loves trying to get those doors to open with her so i think that's going to create some really interesting back and forth scenes you know with those two so yeah, yeah. that really helps cool i uh don't know if my discord is getting um recorded so i'm just going to delete that and uh that'll just be a weird note in the audio (laughs) (laughs) it is annoying me though (laughs) um okay so we're gonna hop into some voice design and this is based off of the the enneagram and the um myers-briggs and my interpretation of it um to think about how jackie would potentially talk with her, her co-workers and her mother which is the first scene involves both of these instances Uh, and this can maybe be used to help figure out how she, she talks in these different scenarios and um, how to really play at that. Uh, For me, 
I've used this before with Jeff, with nerds. We sat down, we created this, and then I never looked at it again. <laughs> so this is, for me, this is one of those tools where you just have a conversation about it and then you just know. Um, sure. This could be that. This could be um, whatever you want it to be. Uh, so I took I took your notes. I, I pasted them over here. You'll have access to this. But um, my thoughts and, on her baseline modulation when she's at work is this analytical test technical jargon uh using more like masculine-esque words because you really have her getting nicknamed jack uh she's mm -hmm. one of the guys so she almost has to play into that um formal she's not really sentimental because that would be too feminine in one sense or another mm -hmm. so like what is basically she's um masculine-esque uh as a character and body language, she would be guarded uh, if her or one of her needs was uh, protection or one of her wants is protection, um, self-contained in her emotions, trying to like be measured. Um, and she would have this like no bullshit uh, pacing. She would be very concise about things and reflective. Does that seem like this character to you? Yes. And I tried to do that. Not, I mean, I was trying to, figured that she'd probably be like dude you know like kind of like what's your deal you know kind of um I really do want her to speak like she's one of the guys and and I mm -hmm. want her journey as like as like going across the series I want her to slowly embrace she's gonna have a love interest that kind of unlocks that feminine part of her who's yeah, a male yeah. that the first male that sees like you're not you <laughs> one of the guys yep you're jackie yep. and you're an amazing woman you know like and really bringing that side out of her in like a slow yep. burn way so i love that totally helps me know where to start with her yep kind of know where i want to finish yeah that and again i'm going to bring up story hypothesis here because i think this plays a crucial role she's protecting herself at work she is guarding herself from her true uh, femininity from her identity because she needs to represent to these other people that she works with that she is uh, one of them more or less mm -hmm. or that she's better than them um, as another option and bringing in that character who breaks down that protection because she clearly doesn't need that she's using that as a crutch and pulling mm -hmm. out her identity that just adds layers onto the story so it's a really good uh, concept and idea to go with and that's um what really quick that's what I was trying to do with like I kind of pictured her slightly germaphobic also I might also mm -hmm. be slightly germaphobic but I kind of pictured <laughs> her I want to I want this to kind of be crime fiction but making my character a little different so it's not yeah. something we've seen before but I wondered if her partner is the one like she just doesn't like to touch things she doesn't really touch things at the crime yeah. scene and he okay. does like he leans on her oh yeah yeah kind of like and that's like but I am one of the guys and look my guy takes care of me when that's not yep. necessarily care but she just that's where the germophobicness is going to come in where he's like someone asks her to pick something up and she just and then her partner's like I got it so that's where that's gonna play a role to because that... I think that's her guarding and that's her like protecting yeah is that Kelso? Is yes. that her partner? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I want to jump into that. But before I jump into that, I, I want to stick with Jackie for one moment, mm -hmm. because at the beginning of your scene, you have her with her mother. And mm -hmm. I think this is a really good moment to show what that looks like, which sure. is not the same. <laughs> um, right. Clearly, like with her mother, she's going to be informal. She still has that guard because e I think even with her mother, she has things that she's hiding from her mother, especially about what she does as a job. I think that um, there are aspects that you you conceal from loved ones because like mm. she deals with killers <laughs> like yeah. well, that's, you know, scary. Um, so it's like the selective transparency of like what her words that she uses with her mother can sometimes be transparent, but are not always going to be transparent. She's going to hold that guard. Um, she'll be more open, but 
she's good because she has to hold back another aspect of herself from her mother to kind of protect her mother. She's going to avoid contact. She's going to do some unconscious mirroring of actions with her mother as well. I think uh, in body language, because uh, it's her mother. She's been, she's grew up with her mother. So she's going to do these actions. And when she's not thinking about it, she might even like sit like her mom or she might like right. you know, do actions like her mom. Um, she'll have a softer, um, cadence than she would at work because this is someone that's more personal to her um and they might flip and have you know spontaneous topics that they talk about um but i think that that's something you can play with with the beginning of showing the reader um how how she's different with these different groups of people because her focus is protecting her focus is um protecting herself from her coworkers and and really making that difference and then protecting her mother from her, her her life uh, ultimately right yeah yeah no that's great um and then with with dean kelso based off of the enneagram information in the myers brig uh at work i see him being uh direct short but he has sarcasm Sar sarcasm that was really weirdly said but he's sarcastic <laughs> he breaks the tension um yeah uh, he's someone that takes up space. Uh, he will do, and this is when you said um, germaphobic versus him touching things. He has the expansive gesturing. He does the movements for her, um, and he uh, he's kind of quick. He he has that rhythm to the way he talks. He'll interrupt. Um, he'll control the conversation. So I can see him being more of the the physical, where she's more of the cerebral. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I which like. plays well with the fact that your character is first person POV and and kind of is talking to the reader. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You ready to hop into this chapter one? Yes. Okay. So I have a ton of notes. They're <laughs> they're all over the place. <laughs> uh, it's because I can't stop. Uh, so uh, with the beginning of this. And this is ruining the end of your chapter, but your end of your chapter, you have a statement uh, where they're at the murder scene where they, uh, the statement is, we see what we want to see. How can the beginning reflect that? Um, how can she see what she wants to see? And I think that there's a couple potentials here. I added like, uh, here's a, a potential start. So are you even listening to me, Tanta? Her mother says, uh, mother's voice pierces through her thoughts, or I guess I'll read this in first person. Uh, my mother's voice pierced through my thoughts, pulling my yays back to the plates of microgreens I'd ordered for the both of us. Sorry, old habits, I muttered, glancing back at the man in his late fifties, conspicuously dining with a woman young enough to be his daughter, both nervously scanning the room. And that's kind of the, we see what we want to see portion of that. Like, it doesn't have to be this exactly, but I think that if you think of a way of tying in that statement, I think that that statement could hold a stronger thread throughout the rest of the story. Um, so I'd, I'd really think about if that's the statement you want, we see what we want to see. How mm -hmm. can you play with that in other scenes? Yeah, um, no, I think that's awesome. And I, and I think too, being a detective, she would be watching other people the yeah only, exactly like I think I was trying to start with something that like I know like I have to get this right in this first paragraphs yeah and I hook the reader immediately and so sometimes my thing is I don't know you know where am I slowing down too much so mm -hmm. and where am I you know I'm all about like wanting to keep that pacing where the reader just like oh yeah yeah. But this is like amazing. I just am like, that's why I kind of was like not sure in that first paragraph. So would you have like just opening maybe of them eating and then the phone call comes after, you know, um, they're like together. Yeah. That they that have like be... a little beat together. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it could maybe open with her being like, that guy's a this kind of person that you know or she's just yeah going yeah in. yeah and then yeah so uh, i agree with it's it's really hard to to begin uh, a chapter i think that having this tiny beat of showing who jackie is before yeah. she goes to work is 
yeah. is kind of important because it really lays the foundation of, um, especially because you will shortly switch. Uh, she's going to be basically be code switching into her, her work performance. So we get to see two different identities right away in the first chapter. I think that that's um, a bit important. It also shows her vulnerability at the start of this. And if there's things that we can get hinted on that she conceals from her mother, that she holds back from her mother. Um, I think that starting it with, and I, uh, my suggestion starts with like dialogue, uh, sure. a way to kind of, uh, as if you're beginning a story by someone cutting into your thoughts, you know, uh, starting off with dialogue is, is a nice way for me. I mean, it's a way to yeah. basically bring someone out of their daydream and just, Hey, hello, <laughs> are you listening? Right. Um, right. that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I think, I think having this little beat between her and her mom before the the phone goes off to tell her that she needs to go um, take care of business uh, helps because otherwise it could turn this scene into an unnecessary scene because you're sure. already setting the stage where she has to leave this scene and then she just leaves it relatively quick. Like there aren't a lot of barriers for her to leave. She's not having this choice where she has to leave. Um, so I think if you played up the choice of her answering the phone or um the choice of uh yeah when she gets up to play up that bit and then have that just a, a little bit later um i think let's see right now this is probably how many words is this uh 188 i think uh you don't have to expand this that much but sure. i think expanding it a little bit is I mean, it's your first scene. You should probably yeah. just add in a little more depth to it. Also, this gives you a really good opportunity because she is looking across the table at her mother and we're in her perspective. This gives a really good opportunity for us to get some physical details about what Jackie looks like by reflecting what her mother looks like. Yeah, that's a great, yeah, that's a great um, because the last thing you want her to do is look in a mirror and then talk about her hair. Yeah. I would do that. <laughs> that would be the first thing I would do. And then I'd be like, Oh no. <laughs> um, but uh, something along the lines of like using her mother as this catalyst to, to describe her, her own physical features is a uh, um, just a quick way, like quick two things about uh, her that we can latch onto that we can anchor to. Um, especially because you, you state, they have Italian heritage, but uh, I don't, I don't see this. Um, yeah. I don't really see right. this at, at this point. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. and then when, when she, you know, when she knows that she needs to leave, she has to start, she almost is going to be code switching in one sense or another. So what does that behavior look like? Does she reach for her gun? Does she reach for her badge? You know, is she like, um, what are her steps to switch? Sure. Um, yeah. Think about that. Um. Oh, think about what the mom wants in this situation. Uh, so at the moment there isn't a lot of room for that, and I think add in a little room for that. Uh, so that they can have this this texture, this conversation between each other. Uh, she could say something along the lines of like, maybe if you just come over more, we could have a proper meal together. Yeah, I'm making like whatever her favorite meal is. You know, something like that. <laughs> Yeah, I like that a lot. That's a great idea. Uh, especially because that ties into the Italian. Um, you could really bring in a, a little bit there. Um, I highlighted the the words, uh, the mother says, you always say that. Is this an overprotective mother? Uh, Jackie put away a killer, but does that make her mother nervous that she catches killers? Would she say something different or more concerned than you always say that? Um, sure. So just play with the, the dialogue mm -hmm. here a little bit. Yeah, um, definitely. And then here, um, I gave an option uh, as to like what else you could say that could add some depth to it. So uh, right now you say, uh, I kissed her on the cheek. Uh, so I just suggest, and you can change this anyway, this first draft for me too. But before leaving, I rounded the table and planted a kiss on her cheek. She smelled of lilacs, a perfume that hasn't changed in the past 40 years of my life. Right. It gives us just a, a little, little something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then uh, obviously if you have any questions, please stop me. I am a talker. No, just I'm osmosis. Like I'm like, this okay. is gold. I'm just putting it in my brain. 
Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so here we are. Uh, the scene has changed. We're now outside of the the house that they're about to investigate. Um, and you have, uh, I know it's going to be a rough crime scene when I see rookie cops are throwing up on the sidewalk. Fantastic and hilarious to me. Um, <laughs> but uh, I have a, another option. Uh, I spot a couple of rookies out front, both gaunt and pale faced, standing above a pile of wet vomit. Great. At least I hadn't had anything heavy for lunch. Uh, to add the narrative voice back in is my okay. thought. Um, and obviously you don't have to again i'm going to repeat myself over and over you don't have to use this but what i'm doing is showing a, a way for you to bring her looking at the camera in one sense or sure. another if that makes sense like you kind of have in in the first person point of view uh, especially with certain characters that are heavy in cerebral you have a way for them to kind of look at the camera and make a joke um and so in this sense you know if she's thinking to herself great at least i didn't have anything heavy for lunch it's kind of like uh, we're listening in on her thoughts and it gives us just that like connection. Yeah. And that's what I think I'm learning about first person is how much do you, I think I was trying to just go in a hundred percent, the character's voice. So like, I love how that sentence sounds, but is that how someone would talk in their voice or are you still doing a little bit more of a narration and then adding you know, because in third person limited, I've got my narrator voice and then I go deep POV with some mm -hmm. italicized thoughts. And that's been very easy. And when I was writing this, I'm like, oh, part of me wants to be the narrator and part of me just wants to talk like they would talk. And so that's where I was just a little confused on how to set this. If it's so, all voice, you know? Yeah. So I think I've seen both you're going to have to decide which direction you want to take. If I were to write this, I would probably try to write in her voice the whole time. Okay. As if like I'm just sitting in her head and I'm having her thoughts. Um, so if, for example, great, at least I hadn't had anything heavy for lunch, isn't something she would say, but she would say something else, then I would just say that instead, you know, but um, no, it's that way more it's like the it's more the the first statement like would she be saying both gaunt and pale faced like oh. that's amazing description but would someone be talking like that but that sounds like a really great narration and so that's where i was just a little confused like i'm a she, big i'm a big narrator so this is hard for me <laughs> no um, i know but i loved it but then i was like oh that's so descriptive but she would say great at least i didn't have any heavy things that's exactly what she would say but would she say the sentence before it and that's where i was just like I'm i would think what would what would she say in replacement to that in her voice in your mind what would she how would she observe two rookies who have thrown up who she didn't watch throw up but she knows there's vomit on the ground yeah like be like man why is that guy sweating so much or something like you know <laughs> like it would be yeah but i see i i'm i'm seeing how this is working so yeah yeah so it's the trick is to try to still just dis be descriptive but in their own voice yeah and kind of i i kind of harken back to like the the private eye mm -hmm. movies where they're they're talking yeah you know, something like that. Like you're going to yeah. have a little narration. Like you you have to have it. Like uh, it just, you, you kind of have some description. Otherwise, um, I don't know if that would uh, really, I don't know. I don't know what that yeah. would look like, but I think that having a little bit of that, that narrative voice or like that, how they talk to the audience is another voice more. Or yeah. Less. Yeah. Um, okay. That's a great way to see it. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that helps. <laughs> well, beans. It does. All this is also helpful. So yes. Okay. Um. Oh, and then just some organization here. So uh, you have her uh, heat cook uh, or the heat from the sun cooked the pavement wafted around me as I stepped out of the car. And then uh, you have a sentence and then you have when I got out of my Tahoe, I saw yeah. my partner just organizing it. Maybe it starts with her stepping out of the Tahoe. You're just blending in those two sentences. Yeah. Oh um oh uh 
Onlookers had gathered on the opposite side of the street, wondering why there was a heavy police presence. Um, careful here, because being in first person, you can't presume what other people are wondering. It's 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 kind of weird. But what you could easily say is onlookers gathered at the opposite side of the street, craning their necks, likely wondering. It's like a little trick. Oh, I see it. Yeah, <laughs> but, gotcha. Yeah. So it's one of those things that like it, it's really hard, but um. That's what I would do because uh, to me, when I read that, it would be a presumption for for her to know that they are wondering if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, yeah, so the description of Kelso, where can you add that in? So maybe it goes here. I do see that you talk about his stocky frame a little later, but it's almost the third time you mention him. And I uh, kind of like a pseudo rule of thumb for me is like either first time or second time that you mention someone, there should be just like something for me to anchor on to other sure. than a name. Um, sure. Uh it's curious if she might say something a little different here. So right now she's saying, dude, Kelso, are you going to lose your lunch or what? Um, would she say something like, you're not going to lose your lunch in front of a bunch of rookies, are you? Yeah. Which is placating to his domineeringness or his macho manness. So, um, or his self-confidence as I've stated here. So just thinking about dialogue and how she might play with, with him in one sense or another, because she would know him and would know what would make him not do what, whatever. He's yeah. Doing. And that's a great way to show that she because I know, I mean, dudes, I, I'm <laughs> like to raz each other. I'm, you know, yeah. what I'm saying? but like, and that's kind of the whole punch in the shoulder kind of, yeah, I know, like, yeah, that makes total sense. So, um, oh, we, you introduce herself to us with my name is actually Jackie, like this whole conversation about this. And I thought, what if we bring this up early? Because right now someone called her Jack. And uh, so she's kind of going into why people call her Jack. But why not bring that up into the beginning where someone calls because we have someone calling. It's loud. It says, hey, Jack, we have I put 10 100. Um, and so then her mother can hear that they're still calling her Jack and then she can ask. Because that's a moment of vulnerability for her to be whatever she wants to say. Yeah, um, that's a great idea. Yeah. I like also, that. did I note this? I don't think I noted this. 10100, I looked that up. That's supposedly a dead body, but just confirm that. Um, okay. <laughs> you can always call your local police department on the non-emergency and just ask them questions or go in and ask questions. Um, as a weird side note. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good. I, I need to do that for sure. Um. Oh, uh. so uh, what's got everyone running with their tails between their legs or something along the lines of like them vomiting just to add specifics on a joke or help lighten the mood? Um, Because I feel like she might attempt to break the tension. She's probably not as good as Kelso, but. Um, yeah, and I did. I could see her I trying. Like, um, one of my students a long time ago was he was like a 70 year old retired um kind of osi so like basically special investigative unit for the air force and they mm -hmm. did interview him and he definitely said that they all joke on the truck crime scene and you would be like oh my <laughs> gosh who would do that but they <laughs> well yeah like, but they do it to like help soften the blow for each other mm -hmm. so yeah. and then i was like well i feel <laughs> it felt weird at first, but then I remembered he said, that's how they, they make wise cracks, you know, yep. not inappropriately, but around things so that it helps them cope in a way. It's yep. a real big coping mechanism. So you're right. I need to put a little bit more of that in there. Yeah. I mean, there's like a, a psychological response to certain uh, terrifying events where people laugh and it's mm -hmm. because the laughter helps break that. So it's it's almost like an unconscious thing that we do uh, as we try to add levity into serious situations so that we can process it better. So, yeah. Um, notes here about uh, potentially his hair or um, now that he's standing upright, we can get a full look of his face instead. So having mentioned his salt and pepper hair earlier, 
maybe now that we oh, see yeah. his full face, we can see something like he, we know he has bright blue eyes from the description, but he's older. So is there some harsh lines that kind of contrast that um, something along those lines? Okay. Um, and then think about like what someone with his personality type might say here. Um, yeah. I also have notes about this later and I, I think we'll, we'll dive into that uh, shortly. Um and then perhaps changing this to like lead the way or remove it all together because it comes a little redundant um, with like, what is this, what we got kind of thing. Um, just a note on a word choice here with nutty. Uh, this might just be me, but nutty always makes me think of aroma or flavor. So like a heavy right. nutty alder door threw me off. Um, oh, so just, I think it is. Weird. I think I spelled it wrong. I think it is supposed to be naughty alder. Is it? That's a type of wood, and I spelled it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that makes more sense. Um, I think it is naughty alder, like it said. I was like, okay. oh, it smelled like... But they could have an aroma. <laughs> so could. Else. Follow your dreams. <laughs> um, okay, so here we get into the house. And in the house, uh, it's we learn to discover that it's a very clean and immaculate house. It kind of looks like it's been pulled from a magazine. So... Um, I have another uh, section here where she's using that narrator voice, whatever that is to the audience yeah. where she's uh, adding in, you know, the shine from the marble tile nearly blinded me, goddamn rich people and their immaculate floors, something along those lines. Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, and then uh, you have here, the expanse almost looked to stage as if residents lived there, uh, but rarely touched anything. And um I, I just suggested maybe something along the lines of it looked like it was pulled straight from one of those home magazines, pretty, but hollow, like no one actually lived there. Yeah. Um, just to kind of make more sense of it in my head, I guess. Sure. Um, here, uh, we have a talk about family portraits, um, a really picture perfect family. How can we peel back the layers of Jackie's life in this paragraph about a picture perfect family who is going on these rich adventures and how can we get a reflection of what that looks like in Jackie's life? So I just think about like sure, one or two yeah. little additions there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, We have a sentence here. I'm guessing the body is the lady of the house. Uh, and this is after they've talked to the housekeeper. Um, So it's, it's a little obvious that it would be the lady of the house because sure. uh, the housekeeper said, I came and I found her. Uh, so just like it, maybe it's something a little different, like who's the victim, just clear statement. Um, because that with that housekeeper talking about a her character, we can kind of assume Jackie would deduce that it was a lady. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, the, when Jackie says, uh, after statement of Patricia Baumgarten, uh, the same name as one of the hospital wings at Penrose, the way that dialogue comes off is almost like a uh, 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 like the writer trying to to give information to the reader. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um. So, <laughs> is there a way to to change that dialogue? So, uh, you know, maybe she asks Baumgarter, like Baumgarter wing at Penrose Hospital. Again, that almost no, sounds a little bit, better. but it's it's getting there. It's something to play with and and think about. Like, how would she uh, ask this question in her voice? Sure. Yeah. Um, and this is one question I did have. So like, do you do this here where like you go, because I have some like different thoughts in italics, but I'm like, is that still from me trying to do third person? Like, do you need that? Or do you just go into it? Like, does, because I feel like even when we're talking, I, I don't think you like, need it. Okay, because I was like, well, if I'm telling a story and I'm using, I did this, I did this, that's different from like when I'm having an internal thought, but you probably yeah. don't need to do that here, right? Yeah, I don't think so. Really, uh, I think it's a stylistic choice to include like explicit internal thoughts in first person in italics or not. It's always going to be an argument of what do you want your italics or uh, what do you want them to be used for in your story? Um, some people will use it for emphasis of a word. Uh, and if they use it for emphasis of a word, then you don't want to use it for anything else. Uh, if you use it in this way, then you're not going to want to use it for anything else 
it'll always sure. be a tool for internal statements. Okay. Um, I didn't really think twice about reading it because to me, it works either way. I'm not a big curmudgeon like Jeff. <laughs> I know. <laughs> jab at Jeff whenever I can um, about italics, but at the same time, um, I don't know if it's needed. Sure. Yeah. Um, here was just a timing reference um, because uh, the neighbors were wondering um, why yeah. it was 1 p.m. and then you stated it's, it's 1 30. So just timing stuff. Um, okay. So we're starting to get into some dialogue. Um, and I'm actually going to skip this one and go to this one instead, because uh, we're we're getting into this like prepare yourself moment. And Kelso's really not telling Jackie what is going on inside. And I I just was wondering, why wouldn't Kelso, Kelso tell Jackie? I would want you to think this through. Why would he be cryptic? Is he not telling her because he's refusing to believe it? So he wants her to go in and be impartial and come to the same conclusion as him. Um, or is he trying to protect her? Uh, maybe she was called to the scene and he didn't know. And now she's there. And now he's like, oh, shit, she's mm-hmm. going to see what I just saw. And that's yeah. a problem. And if that's yeah. the case, then when he first sees her, he should act a little differently. But I think as is this like conversation about prepare yourself and like holding back, it's it's a little strange for a partner to to be that cryptic about what she's about to see um yeah without a without a reason yeah so maybe cuz i do i i actually want it to come from more of a cuz if they're partners she would she would be called to the scene so that mm-hmm. you know so maybe it is more of like because he protects her from the germs <laughs> you know <he's> protecting <laughs> her from this you know, like in a way to like try to get her ready or just so that she doesn't walk in and be like, oh, sh-, you know, like, yeah. So if it's from a place of protection, then how, I mean, I guess he would still just tell her, mm-hmm. but maybe not being as cryptic. I don't know, but you're right. I mean, I just don't know if it's so- a protection place. Would he pull her aside for a second? And I mean, so you could say, I, I'm just, I'm. this is totally me just off the cuff, but um, sure. Jackie, he said in a somber tone, Frank, I nodded. Um, I think we've got ourselves a copycat, he said. And then yeah. she's going to be like, what does that mean? And he's going to be like, I think you know what that means. I'm pretty sure that uh, we, you know, we've got a copycat on our hands or something like that, but like, just be flat out about it. But we start to see that processing in Jackie's mind of what does this mean and start to feel that weight of like, oh, shit. And then we go into the scene and she's prepared herself. And I think that it's not like you have to give away every piece there because they have their own language between each other and we're listening in. Um, Okay. Right. And so like he can just say these bits of things and she can pick up on those cues and we can hear her processing um, in the sense of like, Oh no, it's happening again. And now we're reading it and we're like, what's happening again? And then we go into the scene and then we learn that piece. Like we don't, we as the reader don't have to know everything that Jackie knows because she's telling us the story. Right. Yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. And I'm just like, my mind's buzzing now with all this, but I think too, I I want them because I like showing relationships where you have a, a real friendship because Mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's like automatically, like if they're really close, there should be romance. And I really like the idea of them being like super close best friends, but like in the absolute platonic way possible. So that I am kind of envisioning a better conversation where he's like, I'm, it's obviously a copycat and that's what I'm going to think here. And that's not as a horrible thing to want, but that's what we're going with. (laughs) And, you know, and maybe, yeah, like maybe he, I mean, maybe he could even be like, you don't have to go in there. Maybe he, maybe he doesn't necessarily want her to go in there because it's not like she needs to go in there. 
kind of does but at the same time he's also a detective like he can do that part she could talk to the caretaker a home to cleaner or whatever if that's what he's thinking but she's not going to she's going to go see it because right what the hell is he talking about this is a copycat i need to see this for myself because uh jackie is so like what does this mean copycat like are you kidding me this is happening again and she i feel like she would have that drive to verify things herself yeah she wouldn't she wouldn't she would be like cool 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 i'm great glad that you think that i need to see this right and then be like oh this is gross (laughs) but he could say like hey why don't you because he is the sergeant he's the sergeant Mm -hmm. so he is technically the lead so he has every right to say listen why don't you just talk to the blah 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 or go process this part and i've got this you you don't have to go in there and then that would make her want to just be like excuse me you yeah, know? yeah like get out okay. of the way also yeah. a fun fact unintentionally or not he calls her jackie he didn't call oh, her jack so we had switched so that's actually frank that's the medical examiner oh this is frank okay okay i think i think this conversation should be kelso okay um especially if frank would use Jackie I almost feel like Kelso would use Jackie like I feel like maybe Kelso might be just one step closer into Jackie's like acceptance protection bubble Mm -hmm. yeah okay so that could be yep okay cool um but yeah yeah so that that's the the big thing here is uh just changing that up like who wants what in this scene and really think about that um and then the moment she sees it, I think we need to spend more time in that moment. Sure. We need we need smells. Yeah. <laughs> we need if there's a sound, we need some sound. Uh, we need her detective uh, wires going off. What is she seeing? Is she seeing jewelry still on the deceased body? So clearly, like this looks just like it was before. Things staged. Um, is uh, the the hollowed out eyes staring up at the ceiling? Um, And then my question is, because of the statement, we see what we want to see, which is correlation to the eyes. Is it written up on the ceiling where the hollowed out eyes are looking? Are the hollowed out eyes like, is the head turned a certain direction to see those words? But I think that regardless, I, (laughs) this is gross, but either the head of the victim or the, the eyes that are held in the victim's hands should be pointing wherever the words are. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. Um, just and other... I think that all of that should be grotesquely de- explained here because okay. uh, <laughs> un- it, yeah. it just needs to happen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So this was just a, a potential um, update to uh, the previous statement of like, believe it or not, I've walked into one of these scenes before. So you're kind of like recounting this. Um, Mm -hmm. so here, uh, the knots forming in my gut, uh, weren't from the sight of it all, believe it or not, I've seen worse. Uh, you just need one call about one poor kid, uh, to really change perspective on things. Um, but this, every detail looked the same. So we're, we're reevaluating or reconfirming that like, this is a copycat or this is the real killer. It's the same as it has been since blah, blah, blah. Sure. Um, Instead of it can't be, would she ask, but we locked him up or would she say something else along those lines? Um, yeah. What is she thinking in this moment? Is she really right. thinking copycat or is she like, this is too exact. Like this is a problem. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and then here, uh, what are some things that uh, they might have not told the media even after all this time um, and are things that could be noted here? Is it a token that's left behind something that's taken from the victim or some type of special placement placement? For example, maybe like the the eyes that are removed are put in opposite hands or or something, something along those lines where only detectives would know because it was something that has just been withheld from the public. Right. Yep. No, you're right. So you said all that, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
and this is recorded. Um, <laughs> this is true. I'm like taking notes. Why? <laughs> <laughs> well, you do you. I, you know, it works. Um, uh, we see what we want to see, Carter said. Uh, what does this all mean? Are these new words or were these, was this a statement that the previous killer said? Um. Well, she's like reading the words and yeah. then because she had had not been working with these people during the time of that other murder she's like why why is that written there is more um but those words were there before the same okay. same scene essentially so okay. yeah so is that a potential is that the the thing that the media didn't know um I'm trying to think. I think that stuff still leaks out, actually. Yeah. I, uh, pictures are really tough. Yeah. I think that it would have to almost be something that they could. Uh, yeah. I, I, I just really wanted someone to ask what it meant. Like, you know, yeah. like needed someone to say, why is everyone or it could say, why is everyone freaking out about this? Or well, but that but you're in a crime scene like it just needed someone so that it would intro that last this is what this means. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure how to do that better. Um, you see what we want to see. Um, I mean that it's not like that doesn't work. I just was more or less, I was curious, like, is this something new? Is this something they never learned about? Is this something that maybe Carter, this is the first time Carter's seen this? It's the first time she's seeing it. Yeah. She's not. Yeah. She's been like, what the hell? Why is that there? You know, like. Yeah. 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 Then I think that's fair. Um, Yeah. I think that's fair for now. I think uh, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Sure. Um, But yeah. So um, uh, just as like a recap, uh, overall, this was great. I thought it was really good. You really open your character with this vulnerable state uh, moving into the crime scene afterwards. And that shifts her into this like code switching action moment. Um, play, I would play up the conversations. How do the rookies react to her? Do they respect her? Um, how does that, sir? Uh, how does her partner react when he sees her? Um, add in some grotesquities. <laughs> I don't know if that's yeah. a word, but it is today. It is. Um, because, uh, <laughs> Because that's our first crime scene. And uh, in my uh, reading this, it doesn't seem like that's something you are interested in shying away from. Like, I don't think this is a cozy for you as much as it's a, no. a gripping thriller. So I feel like go for it. Um, yeah. Um, I and, think the uh, question then is like, would this actually be two different scenes in a way? Because I know part of that crime slash thriller genre is very short chapters, very short. Yeah. And so yeah. maybe split it into in a place so that I can add more of those details. So it's not becoming this 3000. So you're at 17. Yep. Yep. You are at 17. Um, so where would you split? So that you can question. really like take time at the lunch and take time um with the crime scene let me see where this would cut off because that's my first initial yeah that's about it um i would as a potential the moment they start talking about this being the deja vu or this being all over again that moment which is um currently frank telling him like prepare yeah. yourself i think that that could be a moment where we're like oh no what does that mean and then we go into the next scene where we actually go into um the crime um that could be one place uh before that i don't think that there's like a a natural cutting point yeah when she arrives and i don't think that you would want to spend too much in chapter one with her mom uh, right i think we need to get to the crime scene mm -hmm. so that first chapter might be in yeah the 1500 ish range but i still think that's reasonable 
Yeah. You'd probably want most of, I mean, like, first of all, write this, please. And don't worry too much about word count. Sure. But when we get to like the editing phase of things, about like the 1200 word ash chapters are, are really popular for this genre. Yeah. Um, well, and that's what people liked about First Strike is they kept the chapters were so short, which isn't yeah. normal for sci fi, but I, it's more thriller superhero. So, and then it was kind of like they kept going, they wanted to see what kept happening. So I could end this where he says, like, looks like we've got a cap- copycat or something yeah, where yeah. they were talking, but I don't want you to go in there or something. And then that's where she pushes her way through. And then I can spend a lot of time. Yeah. That sounds really yeah. good. Yeah. Cool. Well, <laughs> we went through everything. We're amazing. <laughs> amazing. We did it. Um, do you have any additional questions? Right no. Now? No, okay. that was so helpful. Thank you. Good. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, we will stop the recording now. We can chat for a second.